We are now having in Erica Berra, who is the who is a fi Ronald filmmaker. He's the producer of the movie we just uh, have watched, and um, he also worked as journalist, by the way. And um, also notably saying that he's the founder uh, and director um, of the Creative Film Institute, and at the same time of the the Rwanda Cinema Center. So he had a big contribution in actually starting off and creating the Rwanda film industry, the film landscape, as, as we have it now in Rwanda. Do you agree, Eric? Hello. Hello, okay. <laughs> so then, of course, we have uh, uh, in the midst of the panel, the ambassador of the Republic of Rwanda to Germany. She is uh, acting as ambassador since uh, 2009. In, uh, in Germany. And of course, yeah, she's responsible to, for all questions related to Rwanda <laughs> happening here in Germany. So she's also, yeah, hosting all the activities done by the embassy this year. Then we have, we got to, don't want to make mistakes, to Mrs. Uh, Hennicott Schöpkes, yeah. former minister of culture in Luxembourg, and now, as I heard, the vice president of the ICD. It's a big honor. Um, to my right, <laughs> you hear us? So, to my right side, we have Mr. Brandes, and um, yeah, you actually come directly from the field, so you work with the Creative Institute in uh, in in Rwanda. And uh, you are also very much uh, involved in the media cooperation between Rwanda and Germany. So I think we also have insights from you how this works. And uh, myself, my name is Elisabeth Caneza, and I'm working at the Embassy of Rwanda as communication officer. All right. So as you please, we can either first take remarks by uh, our panelists or we have an opening question to start with, and I would actually prefer this opening question coming from you, so that we can have a question to discuss. Yeah. Well, uh, we can have questions to the producer. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, well, uh, congratulations to have such a film. It must have been a uh, very uh, great piece of work. The people playing in the film, they have been people from the villages, from, uh, they are not actors, or uh, have they, uh, how did you choose those many people? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the organizer of this uh, special event. Uh, uh, Ambassador, I really thank you for this opportunity. I think this is the first time that I'm actually doing uh, such a special uh, presentation on Skype. <laughs> so I'm very honored. Uh, to answer to the question directly, um, it was a difficult moment actually to even imagine to go out in the community and tell them that you're going to make a movie after the genocide like three years after, it was, it was quite difficult. But the reason for us to do it was I had spent already many years working, you know, around the BBC and Channel 4 and ZDF and all the others, uh, telling the story of, of Rwanda in documentaries and other, and, and other medium. But each time I'll go to the foreign countries, especially the capital cities of, in Europe, very few people would know where Rwanda was and what happened in Rwanda. So I was quite mad or, or unhappy. So until I met my friend and I told him about my frustration, he said, until you make a feature film, that's when the regular citizen of the world capitals will know about uh, the, the plight of your country. So that was the, the, the first instance for us to embark on that journey. So most of the people that we worked with were not professional actors. So we clearly 
uh, hired uh, young men and women and the people in the communities, especially the, the, the men actors, of course, the men characters. We had to take them through a two months intensive training so that they can actually know how to react to the cameras. Because, you know, many, you know, during that time in 97, 98, no one had even even a, a, a filming camera, or let alone in a bunch of lights. So it was quite an experience. And, and thank you for such a beautiful question. Thank you for such a beautiful movie. Very beautiful. Good evening. <laughs> Uh, I'm very glad that uh, you made it uh, to be connected with this event this evening. Uh, you know that we are missing you here in Berlin. We were expecting you, but we are missing you. Today I know... But I can see, so that's good. I can see the audience as well. <laughs> exactly. Thanks to the modern technology. <laughs> um, I, I, show, I saw the movie for, for the second time this, this evening. Um, and the question I was, uh, I have is to know, uh, have you already shown the movie in Rwanda? Um, and if yes, where? And uh, how were the, the reactions of the people uh, looking at the movie? And the second one, uh, could you also um, uh, screen the movie uh, abroad? And uh, why did you uh, bring your movie then uh, to be shown? Uh, in other countries, uh, uh, and especially maybe also in Africa. That would be also interesting to hear what our uh, sisters and brothers in Africa think about the movie, and, but uh, of course, uh, in particular, what happened in Rwanda in 1994. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, as you, as you may have experienced, uh, each time I also see the film, or, or, I may not know what you may have experienced, but it's a, uh, 100 Days is a very powerful movie, and it's, it's quite unique in its genre, and it's quite a difficult movie. And it's, it's, it's also a very difficult film to celebrate, because filmmaking comes with celebration. And uh, one of the biggest challenge that, challenges that we have faced is how can we celebrate something that is so painful? That's one. Then number two is uh, the biggest problem I had is I had some difficulties in terms of actually project, projecting and celebrating the film in Rwanda, outside of Rwanda, with the Rwanda, so it, it has been a conflict that has lasted for the last 20 years, if I may say. So to, to the question, I have already shown the film to Rwanda. I've shown it uh, a couple of times in Kibuye. So for the very first time when I showed it, after some time, I had two women who were Kibuye resident who fell down and got traumatized. And they couldn't take it, uh, especially in one of the scenes where um, the woman is being uh, hacked by a, a group of militia. So from that moment, I actually stopped or refrained for promoting the film. And then uh, the next day, the next after three years, I took the film to again to Kibuye at the stadium, Gatkwaro Stadium, where over 11,000 people were killed, about 14,000 people were killed in the stadium. And we showed there on these inflatable screens that we take in the film festival. And again, I was faced with the, 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 the conflict of celebration, commemoration, and the importance of film. So it has been a conflict. Uh, but uh, the reception of the film uh, by the Rwandan community has been very positive. They know that it's difficult, and as years go by, uh, I think people always go back to it and say, we have seen all these other films, we have seen uh, uh, Hotel Rwanda, uh, we have seen uh, uh, Shake Hands with the Devil, but let's look at this. And the more they look at it, the more they appreciate it. So uh, I'm, I'm very honored, and I think my, my, the film director will be very surprised uh, to see that this is the film that was chosen for this uh, special event in Berlin. So, in a sense, it has been quite a difficult journey that, uh, you know, I myself and maybe 
with the proximity of the history that you, you know, Ambassador, it becomes a bit of a conflict. It doesn't only become a film, it becomes history, it becomes the people's history. So it's a bit complex than, than just making a film. So uh, for me, it's still a journey, which I'm, I'm still learning a lot. And, uh, and uh, 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 the film has been shown in, in different parts of Africa. We've taken it to Ouagadougou and other places. And uh, for a film to be widely seen, as we always see, you need to spend so much money in promoting it. And 100 Days was such a, an independent film that did not have those resources. The only thing it does have is just like the magnitude of its power. So therefore, it's very difficult for me to be here, you know, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, to tell people here, I have a great movie. <laughs> Uh, because in America, people want to be entertained all the time. Uh, something that is so real and so uh, so film noir, uh, the, you know, the, it's not easy. And and it wasn't picked up for distribution in America. And uh, I think that's why it wasn't widely distributed around the world. Thank you very much. All right, now that we have taken a few questions, because I think some questions might be burning, actually, now that we have the producer. Anyone from the audience? Maybe one, two more questions to the pro di producer directly. What was striking the movie? What? Anything you want to ask him? Hi. Uh, what were the main difficulties you came across in, uh, in making the film? Uh, what was the, 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 the cost or the difficulties of making the film? No, was that the question? No, the main difficulties you came across when making the film, trying to make the film. Thank you. Um, yes, I think everything was... Was that it the, as the question? This was a question, yeah. Sorry. Let's see. Can you see that? Yes, I can see. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yes, so to, 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 answer, uh, to, to answer to that question, uh, and I'm, I'm glad uh, Matt, Mr. Martin Brandes is, is uh, on the panel, uh, everything was difficult to make the film. <laughs> and I think that's the raison d'etre for us to actually, to have had Volker Schlondorf and the Deutsche Welle and the, 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 uh, the, the government of Germany in general to actually support us actually to make sure that the challenges and the difficulties of making films and making these media, medium uh, uh, tools to be accessible and for people to be taught. So when we, st we started making the film, no one understood what film was even. They have seen, you know, on TV and I mean, at the time we never had any, 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 any screening, uh, screening room or no cinema or nothing. There was no film culture. So it was quite an up, it was a bit crazy to, to put it that way. Uh, to go up, you know, with, the, with our government that was trying to rebuild the nation, you know, the infrastructure for healthcare, education, and, and just the basic stuff. And then here comes this man with his director and co-producer from Britain and saying, like, we want to make a movie about genocide. Just imagine that. And, and I think that's what, um, when people look back, they say, like, you know, that guy was a bit crazy, but I think he, <laughs> he, was, uh, he was trying hard. So from the technical aspect, equipment, we went and shot, you know, Kibuya is one of these magnificent and beautiful places uh, out of Rwanda. And at that time when we went there, the place was not tarmac. So it took us almost a day when it had rained to reach the place. And at times we had our vans being stuck in the middle of the road in the middle of the night. And, uh, and bearing in mind that, you know, 97, 98, up to close to 99, you know, we had like some insurgents coming from the Congo and... The same people who are committed genocide were still marauding around the area and infiltrating the jungle and coming to kill people. So that was one of the biggest challenges. And then the second one was uh, the technical know-how. So you had to train all these people, you had to introduce, and you had to tell them that there's no money to make a movie. <laughs> and when they see all of these technical people, uh, they say, like, you know, how can there be no money? And, and it, it was difficult from the financial, technical, and, and training perspective. So, Martin, I think you can, you have seen enough of Rwanda. I think you can help on, on how 
we are carrying the wagon, and uh, and uh, it's still a challenge. But I think at least uh, now we can have the the ambassador and a, a good gathering and uh, and this initiative bringing all of you together to appreciate uh, actually all the efforts. So we're very thankful for that. That appreciation itself is dealing with the challenges we faced about 15 years ago. Thank you very much. Okay, you have a next one. I want to make sure he sees me. How you doing? Yeah, I love your dreadlocks. Thank you. Um, I'm a filmmaker too, and I'm from Detroit. I'm wondering, did you reach out to the black community in America, to churches, to uh, organizations? I have a few ideas about how you might be able to uh, show this film in certain markets, but I'm sure people in Detroit would love to see this film, without a doubt. I know it's a painful film. Uh, it's, it's educational, if I may use that term. And um, I think it's important that people see the film. So uh, I'm anticipating uh, that maybe you didn't reach out as broadly as, uh, as I've suggested. But uh, just what did you do to reach out to uh, the uh, black community and other communities in America specifically about this, especially given uh, the historical connection between uh, black people in America and Africa? Thank you very much. Uh, that's a good question. Um, this film, when it came out, actually, you know, the, the world premiere was at the Toronto International Film Festival, uh, where it was hugely well received. Actually, out of that, that's where uh, the to actually tackle the subject that was a taboo then to be put on film, because you know, genocide is not just you know any subject that you tackle and go and make a film. So uh, the next initiative that we took was to take the film into uh, film festivals. And one of the film festivals that we took, uh, took 100 days to is the Pan-African Film Festival uh, here in Los Angeles, in, in Los Angeles. And then we took it to the uh, African Film Festival in New York. So we have tried actually to expose uh, this film to as many uh, uh, African-American film festival possible and other wider uh, film festival around, around, around the US. But as I said earlier, it's very, it's very difficult actually to promote a film because you know, it costs as much as making it, if not more, uh, and the effort, and, and the effort to be put into it and, and the whole machine. So I would definitely love to you know, give you uh, the opportunity to go and share it in Detroit, my brother. So it's... Uh... <laughs> You're welcome. We'll take a last question. Actually, we'll the last question from the audience for this round. Hi, that was a good idea to go over here. Hi there, uh, my name is Ben. Um, uh, I was very impressed by the film. Um, I've just been working with some people in Liberia who are uh, working on their own film festival, documentary film festival, that should be happening very soon. Um, they're dealing with their own issues of reconciliation and they ha certainly have challenges of production and technical knowledge and logistics that you were just mentioning. So yeah. I think they have a lot to learn from you. Um, my two thoughts seeing the film, uh, I've never been to Rwanda, and I really don't know many Rwandans, but um, number one, I was very impressed by the production quality, um, So, because um, I have seen very many African films, and that was very well done. Um, I was a bit surprised, because I was expecting a big focus on reconciliation, and uh, I'm really glad you mentioned wanting to share the story to people who didn't know about it, because uh, it seemed very focused on... Um, the atrocities of the inter and the Hutus against the Tutsi, which of course is uh, the genocide in question, but um, um, it made me very upset to see. It was very confrontational and kind of upsetting. And uh, I'm just wondering how you might say that, uh, that you find it to be reconciliatory or, or helpful to a healing process. Because um, uh, I'm having, I think, from my perspective, I'm focused more on the, the traumatic and sad nature of it, and I uh, want to see what you, how you would, would frame it as a reconciliatory film and how, how to focus on it in that way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Ben. I think it's a, it's a valid question, and it's a question that uh, prompted uh, the raison d'etre of the, of the making of this film, because uh, uh, Going, going, back, uh, going back a little bit to the genesis of this film, 
uh, I was bitter. And, uh, and my film director was very bitter because this is the gentleman from the UK who had filmed the only footage that was actually, uh, so that showed the genocide, the killings of the genocide. So both of us, we, we bonded and we became friends because we were all bitter. Because the inhumanity of, and the complexity of the whole genocide uh, made us angry. So you're right, Ben, uh, the film has a lot Noir Jean, and uh, and but uh, I have to confess to you that that has changed. That has uh, clearly, uh, you know, moved, uh, you know, to where it was, to where it is today, to like the kind of films that I'm making today. So at the time, I used to be very, very pessimistic. Uh, I never knew that my country would move this fast and this far to bring our community to live together. I mean, for me. Uh, even in one of my earlier statements, I used to say, could there be uh, life after death? Because uh, at, at one point, I never saw life after genocide. So I had a lot of bitterness. And, and at times uh, when I even go back and, and watch some of these films, you know, that bitterness sort of comes back. But it's not the bitterness of hate. It's just the bit bitterness of, of, of pain. And so that was the that was the the element, and 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 that indeed has actually been translated into the film. Uh, and 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 clearly, you can't talk about the genocide without necessarily showing the pain and and the brutality of it. So, but if you if you were to make a movie today about Rwanda, you'll make a totally different movie because uh, the, the country has turned around and has proven us, you know. Some of us, and including myself, who was pessimistic, that uh, it's possible that uh, you know uh, people can reconcile. And and if you look at my my current documentary today, which is called Inore, uh, which sort of looks at the country through the arts, through mu music and dance, and I focus on all these young men and women who had created the new social fabric of the nation. And uh, and so there's a different tone that is that is. Uh, that is transpiring, but without necessarily saying that there's still no pain. Pain is still there, and there's still some grand pain. And uh, but you know we cannot actually uh, dilute the fact that uh, a genocide brings a lot of bitterness, a genocide brings a lot of pain, and genocide brings a lot of uh, you know uh, elements that you know can be very hard to reconcile. But you know with a national. Uh, policy with a, a clear visionary leadership, uh, those things have turned around. No one knew that you know, you know, survivors and perpetrators will sit side by side. And uh, it's still haunting, it's still very uh, traumatic, but through media, through culture, through these dynamics of uh, the kind of things that we are doing that we can hardly express ourselves. So when we get like uh, the project that Volker Schlendorf had is, is supporting uh, with uh, uh, you know, along with the German government. So these kind of things can help us sort of alleviate or tackle uh, the subject that were once taboo, if, if I may explain so. Okay, maybe taking on this one. Um, the, the, the last scene of the, of the boy from the rebel ranks taking this child conceived from, from yeah, from a Tutsi woman and of course this, uh, the, 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 her, her Hutu rapist, right? So mm. I found it was full of hope, right? Hope and reconciliation, reconciliation elements. So, because of course you, you end the movie with that, but can you enlighten us a bit like this image, what does it stand for you? Okay, <laughs> that's an interesting. I think that one could uh, be uh, well answered by the film director, who is not, you know, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll liaise it with him. But at the end of the day, once you make a movie, it's always good not actually to be self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. So you leave some kind of suspense or you play it in people's mind. And, and, and his, his technique or his approach was actually to make a kind of a film noir. So that's why it's a bit disturbing. And, uh, and, and it's very pessimistic. But it's, I mean, for me, that's not necessarily from him. So I'm, I'm not quoting him, but... For me, the metaphor is, you know, this, this new generation yeah. of children who are born after the genocide, okay? 
they are abandoned to themselves. Mm. So it's up to you to make, is it hopeful or is it pessimistic? So, and I'm not in a position of actually clearly giving you the answer that, oh, this is a ray of hope or this is this, is this or this is that. But it's a very intriguing scene and uh, it's a very powerful scene yeah, very because powerful. it leaves you in the suspense. It is indeed. So coming to the, then the next round of questions, um, Mrs. Hennicott Shopkins was asking me after the movie, um, how can a society live with this memory? So this is a question I would like to address to the ambassador. Um, of Rwanda. H how was it possible for the past 20 years for a society to live with the constant memories of, of these atrocities, of a genocide? Uh, I think it's clear that it's very, very difficult to, to live with uh, such a history. And uh, as you saw in the, in the movie, the people knew each other. They were living uh, together in the villages. Uh, they were um, marrying, marrying each other and so on. They were sometimes even related, uh, so that it's very difficult to, to live uh, normally after a loss of one million lives in a society. Um, the most important thing and uh, I think the best thing we made is to, or the chance we had is to have a, a political leadership that didn't want revenge. They just were looked um, in the future and um, decided to, to unite the Rwandan society, to reunite the Rwandan society because in our history, we were reunited. We are one, uh, um, uh, one people, one society. And uh, I think we saw it also, I think, in the movie uh, that it, or was it in another one, that it was uh, part of the colonial uh, heritage that we came so far that the society were, was divided. Um, in fact, it is very, very difficult, and, and Eric also said it, the wounds are there, and uh, it is very painful even today, uh, 20 years later, and, and we are um, aware and, and, uh, th that it will take also generations before we can really say that we overcome uh, the, 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 traumatic, the traumatic uh, um, part of, that, the, of the history. So today we are living in peace together, perpetrators living uh, with, uh, with, um, uh, with their victims. But you also must be very, very careful because this is also a situation where you cannot say that it's done. We have to work on it every day. We have to educate our people every day. We have to give them a political message that brings them and give them the the uh, the power and the faith to work together and to live together to build their own country. This is a very very challenging uh, um, task we have, but uh, it's very difficult also to say how how to deal with it and and somehow so it's. Sometimes I say that it might not be so very difficult because we are one people. We speak the same day language. We have the same religion. We we don't have uh, so 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 big differences. In in Rwanda, Rwanda is one of the uh, very few country in in Africa where we have only one language. So that I think that we have so many things in common uh, that it's uh, it's quite easier to rebuild. These, uh, um, these nation, these, these, to reunite the, the, the Rwandans even after such tragic uh, uh, history and what happened. Mrs. Hennikor um, Shopkin, you are, you are the first president of the, the ICD, and of course, um, as such, you promote uh, dialogue, um, political dialogue, intercultural dialogue as well. We have seen in the movie, especially the, um, the role of the international community at some point, the international community turning its back to the suffering 
um, of, of the people. So my question will be to you, how you, how you saw the role of the international community during the genocide in Rwanda, and what you think should be done about it? Well, I, I would say the film is also an historical film. And it should be shown as such because it's dealing with the main problems of actuality, such as rape as a, a war, uh, means of war that has been condemned as war crime after many, many debates. It's addressing the question of children with arms, children in, in the army. It's addressing the very poor and uh, shaming reaction of the security forces who turned their back and who left the people in the church. It's addressing the poorness of the United Nations uh, uh, security force with three African uh, people coming uh, from other uh, states in Africa uh, in order to help for the whole world community to solve uh, the conflict. So these many problems. And uh, today we celebrate 20th anniversary of the genocide. The 27th of January, it was 70 years of the liberation of Auschwitz. So within 50 years, again, a genocide happened in spite of telling people that having a different uh, shape of the figure uh, of the nose of, of the fingers is not uh, a reason to kill. And uh, we have so much progress to make. And what Ambassador said is a very great sentence. You said we are trying to live in peace together. So the Rwandan people could be an example uh, to so many others, but uh, our duty is to prevent and to inform and uh, uh, to educate uh, people in not having this reaction against uh, uh, humans. Also, actually, one of the main missions of this year's commemoration in Rwanda to educate, to prevent, and to never let it happen again nowhere in the world. Mr. Brandes, now you've been a few times to Rwanda, so when you hear all this... Um, he lives in Rwanda. Hmm? He lives in Rwanda. No, you live in Rwanda. <laughs> so exactly. So actually, you're you are, you are visiting here now. So how, how do you see the, the Rwandan society 20 years after the genocide? Okay, I came to Rwanda last year, so I'm living in Rwanda since one year. So I'm not really... Um, I came to Rwanda knowing about the genocide, what most people know, I think, not so very much. You watch Hotel Rwanda, you, you read some newspapers, and that's it normally. I also, I've never been in Africa before, so it was my very first time, and I was, I was very impressed from Rwanda. It's a very future-oriented country, very modern. People work together, def def definitely like to work together, they want to work together, they want to build a new society, they are already stepping much forward in building a new society, this is very impressive. Uh, all the people I met, all the people I know, they are very serious, they want to learn, they want to create a new society, they already do it, and uh, even the Film Institute, you never believe you see the Film Institute now, it's a building, it's a modern building, it's a, it's a great building, it's a great atmosphere here, and it's very hard to imagine that nothing happened. This was not there six, uh, 16 years ago. So it, was, it is really a very impressive country, and uh, I can only invite everybody to come and see, and come to our institute, and see what is happening in Rwanda. It is fascinating and it's beautiful. And would you say you, 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 see, the, um, you see the impact of film? Because of course, uh, Eric said it before, uh, the film industry in Rwanda was almost non-existing 
<laughs> before you came. <laughs> so um, do you see film having this cultural impact or impact of reconciliation in this process? Definitely, I think because film is teamwork. You have to work together, you have to create things together, you have to work technically together. This is definitely what people need to do. This is kind of, let's say, very small so, so piece of so, society, but it's any time a teamwork. So no, nobody can step out, then it's not successful anymore. And I know this film is, has a fas fascination many other jobs don't have. So I think film is something for making people more happy. Film is giving people more information. Film is uh, doing something for the economy. It's uh, creating jobs. We do a, we do a, an, an initiative which is initiated by Volker Schlöndorf, the award-winning director. And uh, we have the support of the German government for creating a new dimension of film school. We have a hands-on hands training for young people in film profession and technical. We do workshops. So we start a, a kind of brand new film training and film education in, in Rwanda, which also will have an impact to the society. Uh, maybe not today, but definitely tomorrow. So, and um, maybe to come to a question now to Eric before we would like to open again, of course, the floor for you to, to ask more questions. Um, Eric, definitely, film is a, is a weapon. It's a, it gives you a voice somehow. Yeah? It, it, um, it gives you the opportunity to tell your story, to present your, your story, and maybe the story of a people, the story of, of a country. And uh, the fact that we are now uh, watching a movie produced by Randan, um, do you think this, this might also be like one of the goals to use film as, um, as a voice to tell the story of, of the Rwandan people? Thank you very much. Um, of course, film is a very powerful medium to communicate your history, your culture, your identity and, and many, many other things. And uh, by having the Rwanda Media Project uh, uh, being implemented uh, from this year to carry on for two years is very, very important because you give people skills, you give the people knowledge, you, you, you give them education on how to tackle these things. But there's actually one element that I would like uh, the panelists actually to, con to consider, especially the representative of ICD, um, which is one element that I had not uh, fully introduced into the into the program that we are launching and actually this discussion here has triggered my inspiration has triggered more more ideas and a concrete idea because actually we're having this conference in san francisco i'm in san francisco now where i'm attending a, a summit called uh, wisdom to summit so for the people in the audience they can look at it it's wisdom number two then summit where our president is actually addressing is one of the keynote speakers and uh, where are all these minds it's like they take the imagination the the power of communication and they use all these creative minds on how actually to reflect on humanity and uh, the idea that comes to my mind is uh, it would be really really important to have a room that can facilitate that. I know, Martin, I'm going to get technical and talk about the project, but I think it's good for the audience and especially the representative of ICD to see that uh, this kind, of, uh, this kind of, uh, of, of platform is very healing. You know, I got a little bit emotional into the discussion because it was just taking me back. But at the end of the day, you see that you just, we just give people the skills we will people give people the skills, but we also need to give them some kind of a, a psychological, um, psychotraumatic, uh, you know, post post traumatic kind of sort of care. Uh, reason why I'm saying this is because while I was making Inore this this documentary I'm releasing in April, I was with one of my young students. Most of the young men and women whom we work with, when they become 
knowledgeable. They don't only become my students, but they become actually my partner. So we were driving, going to Butari in Nyanza. And uh, we arrived in Gitarama, just uh, and across the road. And then the young man said to me, this is where they, they killed my parents. And then I said, like, how? And then he, in, in 40 minutes, he told me a story that I did not want to hear for the last two years. We have been teaching him and he has been around me. Martin, this is a young man called Regis. And Regis told me how he walked for two days from Kigali to Gitarama. And, uh, and yes, you can give people the skills, but I think it's very important to prepare them psychologically. And, because I wasn't prepared. I did psych child education and psychology, but I wasn't prepared. I mean, the, the subject of the genocide is something that you can ne not get prepared with, however much strong you may tend to be. And uh, so... <laughs> Martin, in, on, on the floor or in the space of the multi-purpose space, please make sure that you get the same floor that you have and somebody gives you a roof so that you can have a discussion like this because there's a program for, for launching a two-year program to initiate the young men and women to actually on, the, on these techniques of actually telling the, the stories of their nation, but they need to be prepared. They need to have conversations like this because this is beyond just showing a film. So, yes, we, Kaneza, we want to tell, to get them be storytellers. We want to have them discuss and present their films, but they need to be psychologically prepared. So this, for me, is not just a, a discussion. It's actually a, a psychological therapy that I'm experiencing here. So thank you very much. We, we are honored to be part of it. <laughs> very wonderful. So do we take questions from... We won't take the book question. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you need the microphone. Thank you. Is it me I'm hearing? Yes. <laughs> okay, in the meantime, you can take mine. She should stand up so that he can see. Um, my name is Cecilia, and I'm an intern at ECD. I would ask uh, Mr. Cabra. Um, what does it mean, the Kvetu Film Institute, for you, both professionally and personally? Professionally and personally? Uh, that's a good question. I've actually been asking myself what it actually means for the last few days. That's a, it's actually a very, a very uh, pertinent question. It, it comes at the right moment. It's very funny. <laughs> Um, because I've been away for two, about two months trying to edit my film and things like that and then I've spent the last six years trying to build a film school and then a few days ago I was like what does it mean this square to institute and things and what it means is like what you cherish the most if you can share it if you can be generous and share it and, and I think that sense of mankind I mean Kwetu Film Institute Kwetu is a Swahili word that means home and so, you know, institute is, is a film institute. It's like the Home Film Institute, where people can come and, and feel at home. But to answer to the question is, um, if I can answer it into my philosophical sort of aspect, I would say that it's my, it's my extreme level of selfishness. Because being selfish is actually being very generous. Because it gives you pleasure to do it. And I've been very fortunate enough, actually, to have people around me who are generous and who understand exactly my level of, uh, of, uh, of appreciation or my level of selfishness. Because I want to achieve it so much. I want to build an institute, yet I don't have any money. I'm in debt, and I keep on begging. I mean, you, you become a philanthropist if you have made so much money. <laughs> so I've done the reverse. So that's, that's, that's the explanation. It's the selfishness to be generous. And, uh, and I've built this place, and uh, many people are supporting and are to support to literally make sure that the, 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 the difficulties we have to actually have a space like that, a space of dialogue, a space where people can come and ch be changed. For me, it's incredible. It's, uh, it's a gift. It's, uh, it's the best thing that can ever happen to my life, beside my, my family and my children. Uh, but uh, it's great. It's just like seeing all these people. 
because education is an incredible tool and culture and education and educating people to think uh, correctly differently and being empowered is uh, is great uh, it's yeah so it's it's still selfishness it's auto satisfaction in a sense as well uh, but it's something that you feel so deep into you that you cherish so much because filmmaking or film changed my life or changed the way how I look at things and how actually I can get my, my country's history being trans, trans, you know, transmitted or shared. So if we can have many of little me, <laughs> that would be great. That's, that's the way. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's why it's such a great medium. So now I would like to uh, take the question back to the audience because usually the audience is asking now, we want to ask you. Eric just said, it's a great thing to, to use film as a means of education. Can I ask the question to you? Do you think this movie opened something, educated you on, on the story of Rwanda? And if yes, why and how? Anyone courage enough to answer this question? Yeah, so this is also important to give feedback, not only to producer, but also to, uh, in quotation marks, our experts here. Yes, we have, a, we have an answer. Thank you very much for being so courageous. <laughs> Hello, my name is Natalia. I'm from Poland. <laughs> I said it a lot today. Um, uh, so the question is, did it educate me? Yes. It moved me very much. Uh, I have never heard of Rwanda before, but now I will definitely remember it forever. And uh, I just couldn't hold my emotions. <laughs> So we didn't intend that, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, she has a comment. Hi, my name is Christina, I'm from Slovakia. I have heard about Randa before, but not that much. I would like to also thank you for this movie. It was really, maybe I'm too sensitive, but it really touched me as well. It was very nice way how you did this movie because really, it's important to show these things, and it's important to show it also to young people in order to like, strengthen them in their opinions that these things can't happen anymore, or at least we have to do as much as we can to prevent these, uh, these things. So thank you very much that you, did, um, you had this effort and you, ha you gave so much energy to this movie that you, were, you just shared this with us and you can educate us. And I hope this will never again like happen again. And I would like to wish you like all the best to your efforts and the future movies because they are really well. So good luck and thank you very much. <laughs> this was to you. We had a question in the back. You you will get your turn. I saw you. Hi, I'm Tatiana. I'm from Croatia. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, opportunity to share this really uh, very strong feelings uh, and uh, I just want to point out two things. Uh, you mentioned your documentary, another one, uh, about dancing, music, uh, another different picture from your country. This is opposite to this uh, movie noir uh, and there are even two different uh, <laughs> tasks for feelings. I'm sorry, I'm deeply touched by the movie. It's not true. <laughs> it's really not true. It's really taking us with. I was just thinking back into my childhood in Balkan. Uh, when we grew up, we were facing the history in 40s. Every day learning about what happened. Mm. People to people killing. My generation. Mm. It happened again mm. in 90s. What we learned, we also celebrated dancing together. Mm -hmm. Tito created Yugoslavian identity. We loved each other. We didn't question anything before, but it happens. So for me, it opens a uh, question about also what role can religion take, uh, religion communities um, in education? Uh, how can we change uh, the task of uh, building on one, dominating, uh, into t t toward universal, uh, many ones. Uh, how to um, celebrate shared val uh, values, not nation branding, but international branding uh, should take part. And 
national brutto product should be more toward uh, participating of all people, not nations. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even United Nations peace operation uh, was uh, seen as uh, a part of uh, the world who can't uh, really help. Um, we saw priesters doing uh, things uh, which are not adorable. Mm. So what can we really change? Because my generation learned all of those values. We celebrated community. We remembered uh, the victims of the Second World War. But still, it happened in Srebrenica. And I, I feel with you, really. And um, I would really ask uh, all of those people here, um, if they really know uh, about uh, how to change or how to contribute to better education, to really uh, open more critical meaning toward religion and uh, religious communities and uh, nation brandings, because it, it took a big part of our life and I think it's time to change it. Yes, Thank that's you. a very important question. And I think, of course, what, uh, what you then mean is, of course, taking in all these stakeholders, you know, sometimes involved in conflict, but also like the notions used to mobilize conflict. Like in the Balkans, it was very well religion. You know, in, in Rwanda, it was the so created ethnicity. So all these um, instruments who, which act as mobilizers for, for, for conflict, maybe. Mr. Shopkins, you can answer. I think Eric said something uh, very important to have uh, the psycholo psychological work uh, with people who lived it. I uh, was assisting to a theater play, play, uh, play uh, related to the experience of uh, young soldiers, children soldiers. So there are many, very many in Africa. And they have, uh, they are now adults, but what they lived as children soldiers is so essential that they should be helped to overcome it and uh, to have, uh, uh, to work it up. And in the Balkans, it seems to me, there is a fundamentally difference in uh, the cultural aspect of revenge. In the Balkans, revenge between families is tradition. It's a very long tradition. Perhaps it's not uh, correct to say in the Balkans. It should be more specific where it is between families. But from generation to generation, revenge is in the culture. And the one who does not take revenge, he is... Uh, um, uh, doing damage to uh, the, uh, his family, to the name of his family. And one initiative at the level of the United Nations is uh, uh, installed recently, and it's peace-building measures. I think we should invest much more in peace-building. People are not only having a head, but they have a stomach. And sometimes, the instinctive uh, way to solve conflicts is much stronger than uh, reasoning by intellectual uh, laws or by uh, restraining from uh, violence. That's true. Uh, speaking about peacemaking measures, I don't know if many of you know it, Rwanda is now, after 20 years, um, holding a non-permanent UN Security Council seat. And um, I would just like to ask the, the ambassador, how is Rwanda yeah, promoting or contributing to, to taking the, the, this topic, this, this very strong and, and difficult topic of genocide, prevention of conflict, beyond the border of Rwanda, and actually mm -hmm. to, to make it a global debate, a, a global responsibility? How is Rwanda doing that? Um, one thing we, we, we learned from, from, from our, our uh, history is that uh, there is a responsibility to protect not only the own people and the people, the government should not only protect their own people, but also internationally, meaning that um, 
in Rwanda, what happened, the government killed their own people, but no one felt responsible enough to intervene and stop it. And it was a big mistake, and we learned that we should not do the same mistake again. Uh, today, Rwanda, as uh, Elizabeth said, we are uh, holding a, a non-permanent seat in the UN Security Council. The last time Rwanda was sitting in the UN Security Council was exactly 20 years ago, while the genocide was, was being perpetrated in Rwanda. The government had their representative in the UN Security Council, meaning they did, didn't contribute to know exactly what is going, down, going on uh, in, in the country. It's not only that responsibility. Everyone knew what was going on. But to see today, the Rwanda today, sitting in the UN Security Council, it's a country we are very proud of. It's a country, as Eric said, that made so tremendous development in the last 20, in the last 20 years. No one should have thought that after 20 years, just only 20 years after the genocide, the people in Rwanda will be living uh, in peace. Rwanda is one, one of the most, if not the most secure country in Africa. Rwanda is um, grow, having an economic growth of uh, more than 8% per year since um, more than five years. Our children are going to school in peace. Without, uh, all children have the same changes, what, is, what wasn't the case in the past. The Tutsi children were uh, discriminated. We saw it also in the film. Uh, they didn't have the sh same chances to go to school. Today, uh, it, it doesn't matter if you are Hutu or Tutsi. What matters is if you are good or not. Um, the, the, your, your, your marks in the school, school are the most important. Meaning that what we live today in Rwanda, people having uh, health insurance, what wasn't, the, the, the only uh, health insurance uh, uh, nationwide in, in Africa, so that we have so many uh, achievements that no one could have thought that it would be possible to, to be realized by, by Rwanda. And this is the Rwanda today. And uh, talking about uh, responsibility to protect, Rwanda is one of the uh, countries that provides uh, uh, peacekeepers. Um, our troops, our uh, soldiers are under UN mandate in, uh, very recently in uh, Central African Republic. We are in Darfur, we are in, uh, uh, in Haiti and elsewhere. And our troops are very, very much estimated for esteemed for what they do, for their discipline, uh, their professionalism. And I think this is also because of, as Rwandan, we, we know exactly what it means not to be protected. This bad feeling of being alone, left by the whole rest, uh, rest of the world. And I think it's, uh, it, it's so, a so bad feeling that we don't want anyone to experience it anymore. Mm -hmm. And we are doing our, our best contributing to uh, to peace and 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 uh, to peace and uh, to peacekeeping missions, uh, we understand it as one of our responsibility, not only for Rwanda, also internationally, not only for our children, but also for uh, uh, the, the the children and the, the grandchildren uh, all over the world. But that, that's a, that's a very high high mission, and we saw in your in, your, in the film, Eric. That there was one scene when uh, actually a, for, a foreign soldier said, um, "These people are Africans. Yeah, they are not worth any of of us." Mm, yeah. So, is it not like very, not even like almost contradictory to to say nobody wanted to risk their lives for us? But hey, we go out to Mali, we go out to to to, to Central African Republic to to risk our lives for the sake of for the sake of peace, for the sake of another person's life. How, how, what, what do you take from this? Uh, of course, it's a, it's a, as I said earlier, I was very pessimistic and I never knew that my, my country would rebound. And uh, 
from there and now, I think there are many elements that uh, may be taken from the Rwandan you know, current chapter that can teach the world. I was actually talking to some uh, someone in uh, two days ago, and he said, I think uh, your country's example could eventually turn around things as far as message is concerned in the Middle East, whereby, you know, you guys live, you know, what the Middle East hasn't managed to do in the last 50 years, you've managed to do it in less than, than two decades, and, uh, and that's, that's extraordinary. Uh, we, needless to say that we still have challenges, but at the end of the day, the fact that we live one of the most um, sort of secure places. I mean, I was walking downtown San Francisco last night trying to, to look for my friends uh, last evening, uh, you know, so that we can go for dinner. And literally, I walked 10 minutes away from my hotel, and I was scared. <laughs> I was really scared. <laughs> and I came to them and said, man, uh, I mean, you know, uh, and uh, so that's that thing, you know, where we, we feel like, you know, this is a country that has such a turbulent past, but this is a country where you can walk around freely in the night during the day and things like that. We take it for granted, for one, but actually last night I went like, okay, man, I could have been stabbed just like you know, two blocks away from my, my you know, my hotel. So, and, uh, and it's, it's. It's a good contradiction, uh, and you know I don't know whether there is such a thing as a good contradiction, but it's a good, it's a contrast mm. between the people that was abandoned and the people that is now busy uh, being, you know, airlifted to be, to go and and, and save uh, and protect uh, civilian lives. So, so would you now say you are no longer a pessimist when when it comes to your country? Are you now an optimist? Uh, you know what? In my next documentary, we're actually trying to talk to Corney. Because Cornet, I think you know Cornet is this uh, a famous run and singer and musician in Canada and in France, and uh, so he, I think you know he's uh, he's likely as well to give us uh, a message of his turnaround. I think Cornet was one of the uh, highly respected young man who was um, uh, you know went through, you know, some tragic experience, lost members of his family, like many other people back, back home. But uh, by looking at sort of the, the current situation of Rwanda, and, and please, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, so that people don't walk, walk out from the, from the hall where you're seated, you know, sort of in pain. So I would kindly ask you to play them the clip of two minutes. Of course, it's got some elements of, of, of the history, but it's also got some elements of... Um, of, of, of young, young talents and young, young Rwandese who are literally projecting a new, a new face of Rwanda. And I think that that would be a, a best way to actually be more productive. Uh, but, you know, by being careful, you know, that's why I said that it's good to have um, uh, partners to actually create some kind of dialogue, you know, showing a film or making a film is another thing, but creating a discussion, because most of the students that we receive, as I said earlier, you know, I, I, I tend not to go so much into their personal histories, because it always tends to traumatize me. It always tends to pull me down. So I just try, you know, that's why we do the Run Film Festival. We create some kind of uh, a celebratory kind of a situation out of our pain. I don't know whether it's, I can say it right. So, and asking to, to uh, responding as well to the question about religion, whether religion can help. And, uh, I'm here to confess that I'm a preacher's husband. So oh. I do this preaching in, 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 in film and my, and my wife does uh, her things in this social psychological therapy in terms of literally you know, taking care or caring for women who have gone through all these traumatic situations. So that dialogue is very much needed, and that space is very much needed where people can have this and, and, and continue it so it doesn't become just a one-day event. So, Ambassador, the, the task, the ball is in your court. I think we need to continue this dialogue between... We have to... We are learning a lot from, you know, from, from this platform, and while I'm here in, in, in the U.S., because I'm, I'm collaborating with the Shaw Foundation, the Steven Spielberg Foundation, that created uh, the, the, the recordings uh, institute for, mm. 
all the, the survivors of the Holocaust. And I think this dialogue needs to continue so that yeah, so that this space can can, can Thank continue. Thank you very much. And I think I think I think that's a very good uh, concluding word. Of course, that's what we are doing here very much indeed. Dialogue, discussing, educating, learning from each other. So considering the time, we may come to the closure of this wonderful uh, deep discussion. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. We will have, will have, nevertheless, we'll have time to engage in discussions afterwards. Afterwards. Okay. Eric, we, 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 we sorry, we, Eric, we take we take a very last question because we okay. have very well, go to the summit as a well. person yes. very insisting here. No problem. You, you can take my microphone. Okay, one I hate minute. To, I, one I, minute. I, I hate to be uh, forceful, but I think it's important Sorry, one because minute. there are a couple of things that disturb me, my brother. Um, yes, we want the genocide. To, we want, don't want this to happen again. But I would maintain it's still going on, maybe not in Rwanda, but in other places around the world. It can't be that a, that the singular act of killing people is a is the essence of genocide. It has to involve much more than that. It has to be a systematic thing. I'd like you to respond to that. Also. There's a question in America. Uh, there's a slogan out. It says, mass incarceration plus silence equals genocide. So, and that, that, that refers to the one and a half million black men that are in prison now, along with 600,000 Latinos and 200,000 whites. Or people whose lives have been destroyed, who never see their families again, or have great pressures being brought uh, to bear. Not to mention all of the genocides that have happened in the last 100 years. Now, as I said before, I think that this is an ongoing process. It's not just a question of a singular act, but a process. How would you respond to that? Thank you very much. We take the I think uh, just uh, quickly, I think that's, uh, that's the whole essence of this discussion, and that's the whole uh, importance of film, because film brings us to reflect and, uh, and to project some, some, uh, some, some message of hope, but strong reflections. I mean, being here in America now, I mean, I'm experiencing like a, a wave of, of film tackling, you know, those social injustices, you know, be it you know from from from, from the time of slavery, you know, uh, and to 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 many other films like Fruitville and uh, The Butler and uh, and few others. So it, it it can't be singled out, but at the end of the day, it's an ongoing education process whereby you know education is the strongest tool that you can give to the community so that they can be aware, they can be aware of their responsibilities and how to take care of their communities. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll respond to that. It's, it's an ongoing process and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a struggle that we all you know, need to be engaged in. And, uh, and you know, whether we're gonna win the up, uphill battle in actually engaging our communities and giving the right messages that can actually empower and, and get people to reconcile with their past and present. I think that's that's the bottom line for me. It's, it's an ongoing process, and I think mainly if, if some of you make it to go to Kigali, to the genocide memorial, actually you will see that it, there's no singling out. The, the genocide uh, against the Tutsi in Rwanda is very much brought into context with human history, atrocities against uh, humanity, and other genocide of the world. And this is also the message of uh, this year's uh, commemoration. It's we, we talk about Rwanda, but it's actually like to give the example of saying this should never happen again and it happened somewhere else and it should never be in the future. So, Eric, we thank you. Thank you very much. I think you can have an applause. <laughs> yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Yeah. Wonderful audience. We will for doing this and uh, everybody else have a wonderful evening. Uh, today I'm starting my shift of the day now. I have to go to the conference again. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the, the, I, I thank my panelists, but the last word, of course, uh, has the ambassador. So I'm now handing over. <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Eric, let me start with you uh, to thank you, first of all, uh, uh, and most importantly for, for the film, for the movie. <clears throat> it was indeed very, very uh, moving, but were also very educating. And uh, uh, as Rwandan, uh, I must confess that when I look at the film, it's hard to believe that it really happened. I know that it's not science fiction. It really happened, as you showed it in the film, and it was even worse. 
So thank you very much to, uh, for the film. Thank you that you made it possible uh, to be connected to the discussion uh, uh, this evening. Uh, so I let you go uh, for, the, for, the, um, for your conference. Uh, of our regards to our, our president and all other <laughs> random uh, participants. And uh, we'll continue here the session by uh, some few words to thank you all. Uh, that you came for to this uh, event. Uh, for us as, as Rwandan, uh, this year is a particular one. We are uh, um, commemorating for the 20th time. Uh, and we have, uh, as you might so see, uh, remember, unite and renew. Uh, we want to remember um, what happened. We want to remember the uh, people who lost their life innocently during the genocide. <clears throat> we want to look back in the history, uh, want to avoid to forget, because if we forget, it will be a big mistake, because once we forget, you are, you, are, you are then on the best way to, uh, to have it again. So once to not to forget what happened, uh, and second to um, pay tribute uh, and honor the people who lost their life. But you don't also want to be kept by the history. We remain aware of what, what, can, what happened and what can happen, but you also look in the future and we uh, have a united uh, nation today. We have a united youth. We have a very vibrant, very intelligent, talented youth. They need to have uh, a better future. And uh, we see it as our responsibility to give them uh, a framework where they can really uh, live freely. They can live in peace. Uh, they can. Uh, go outside in the world and be very proud of being Rwandan because uh, I'm, I, can, I must tell you that in 94 and the, nine, then the years after, we were very ashamed to be Rwandan because of what happened. But today, we are very proud to be Rwandan, that we were able to come out of such uh, tragic history and uh, to start from scratch and today being able to be represented in San Francisco and elsewhere in the world, to be in the UN Security Council, to have a voice, to have the world looking at Rwanda and wondering how we made it. So thank you very much and we continue to be uh, with us in this year, but also in the future. And please learn from Rwanda and do everything that it doesn't happen again. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Mark, you wanted to give us some words, or yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> the, the very last word. Exactly. You know, there's no need after the very eloquent uh, closing statement of the ambassador, but just also from our side at the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, thank you uh, for giving us the honor to pay tribute this evening to Rwanda, and uh, we're very, very happy to see all of your support, and uh, we very much hope that we can continue our collaboration, not only to remember, but also to continue to move forward, uh, where reconciliation is needed not only still in Rwanda, but actually around the world. And I think there, there's definitely a lot that we've learned this evening. Thanks for this excellent film and the discussion. So maybe if we could have a second round of applause once again for the entire panel, as well as for the, the movie. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for everyone who contributed, of course, to the success of this event, starting from the, the staff of the ICD and uh, all the interns, everyone. Thank you very much. And we are moving forward indeed. We are moving forward to the reception. And uh, so you're all welcome and nice evening. Thank you for coming.